I was hesitating. Whether or not there is time for um, a Dvar Torah tonight. So I think I'm going to do a one minute Dvar Torah tonight. I think I have until 8.05 if we want to end on time. Uh, maybe four minutes. Okay. I, I just, I need to do it because this is, this is the Torah portion. This is the crucial story in the entire Torah. Well, maybe not the, but at least from the book of, from, from the last four books. This is the moment, you know, this is the moment we finally left the foot of Mount Sinai. Finally. It took us two books to get away from the foot of Mount Sinai. And we've been traveling, we've been traveling to the promised land. And in fact, the trip from Mount Sinai to the promised land just happens within one Torah portion. And here we are in this week's Torah portion at the border of the promised land. It's been two years since we left Egypt, a year and three quarters at the foot of Mount Sinai. The rest is the time it took us to get there, and the rest is the time that it's just taken us to get to the promised land. And Moses says, okay, folks, before we step in and take, take the promised land, uh, let's be smart. Let's send some spies to, ch to check it out. Um, see who lives there, what's the status of their um, dwelling, um, how well armed are they, you know, just like you want to know. So Moses gathers 12 elders, one from each of the 12 tribes, and sends them on a mission to scout the land. Moses is hoping that they will come back with great news, and that the day after they come back, they will simply just walk into the land, end of the story, roll the store scroll, we're good to go. We got it. 40 days and 40 nights, the scouts travel through the land. And they come back, and the whole community assembles to listen to their report. And they begin, the 12 of them, saying all kinds of marvelous things about the promised land, a land that flows with milk and honey. Um, they, show, they show the cluster of grapes that they had brought. They had to carry two people on a frame because the, the grapes were so huge just to symbolize the abundance of food and produce in the land. Just incredible. Just everybody's just, ah, oh, it's going to be great. And... Ten out of the twelve said, uh, but we also saw some things that were not really fabulous. The people who live there, they're really strong. They live in fortified um, cities that are, are going to be very challenging for us to take over. Um, they are extremely well armed. In fact, they are giants. And they are giants. They're they're just um, they're just we we we're not going to be able to do this. There's there's no way we can win any kind of battle against these people. We're doomed. Uh, forget about it. They said, let's go back to Egypt. Two of them said, are you kidding me? Like where is your faith in the eternal? We can overcome. We can do anything we want. We can walk into the promised land. God will provide. What are you talking about? No. But that was too late. That was too late because those 10 elders seeded the seed of fear in the rest of the people. And you can, you can imagine, and there was no Facebook or anything at the time. But the news spread very quickly through the millions of us who were encamped at, uh, at the border of the promised land. We can't go. It's too hard. We, the land devours its people, they said. The land devours its people. There are giants there in fortified, impregnable cities. There's no, we can't go. We can't. It's going to be a disaster. We're going to die. Let's follow those 10 and let's he head back to Egypt. And Moses, you know, just his face just drops. I mean, he doesn't know what to do. And God, as always, is angry. 
God spends his time being angry with us. And he said, well, if that's the case, um, if you're not willing to go into the promised land, then what we'll do is that we're going to keep you wandering in the desert a year for each day that the scouts spend in the promised land. So they had already, it took them two years to get there, so 38 more years. 38 more years of wandering in the desert. So that the generations of Israelites that knew enslavement in Egypt dies off. And a free people who didn't know slavery in Egypt, a free people can enter into the promised land because God understood, according to the literal level of the story, that only free people were of the consciousness that was required to enter the promised land. Fearless, with no baggage. And that's why we're going to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the turning point in the story. And through those 40 years, in fact, all of those who had known slavery in Egypt are going to die in the wilderness and their descendant who had not known slavery will be the ones to step into the promised land. Even Aaron, Moses' brother, Miriam, his sister, and Moses himself will not step foot into the promised land. All of them also will die um, and a new generation will lead, will lead the, the Israelites um, into the land. So, you, you know, I had to say a few things about this Torah portion. And what I'm going to say about this very briefly is actually connected to the name of the Torah portion. The name of the Torah portion, which is the first verse of the Torah portion, is Shlach Lecha, which gets translated as God saying to Moses, sent Send for yourself 12 elders, one of each tribe, to scout the land. Shlach lecha. But shlach lecha can also be understood and translated as send to yourself. Not for yourself, but send toward yourself. And so maybe this is not at all about a story happening somewhere in a wilderness, somewhere in a geographical area, maybe the story is talking about each and every one of us listening to the divine, telling each of us, send for yourself, to yourself, in yourself, scouts. This is maybe telling us or inviting us in a process of self-inquiry. A process of self-inquiry to, to discover within ourselves that we, in fact, always already live in the promised land. But we have convinced ourselves and therefore have manifested in our world hell. I mean, seriously, if, if we think about it, we have all that we need on this planet to live in the Garden of Eden. This planet is the Garden of Eden. And yet, we have managed to destroy it. We have managed to just murder each other for generations and generations. We have turned this place into the very opposite of the Garden of Eden that it was supposed to be for each of us. And war is still happening. Famine is still happening. We still haven't figured it out. We're still so enthralled by our own ego and our own power and our own greed that we have lost sight of the reason why we were on this journey to begin with. Because we have lost the ability for inwardness. We have lost the ability to listen to the voice within us that says, Shlach lecha, go toward and go within yourself. And send this little scout to discover who you really are. You know, those, those, those inner spies that are going to figure out your peaks and your valleys. Your ups and your downs. The, the, the moments of, of, 
of great clarity and the moments where you fall into your shadow parts. Like, it's another way, it's the Hebrew of saying, know thyself, I think. Shlach lecha, know thyself. Because if you inquire into the nature of your true being, then you'll discover within yourself your sacred presence, the sacred presence that animates every breath, that beats every beat of your heart, the sac sacred presence that is aware of every thought you've ever had. But if you don't do that, then you are owned by those thoughts. You're enslaved to those thoughts. And so perhaps the story is not just to send scouts to inquire within the true nature of who you are, but also let the parts of self that are enslaved to your identification with your physical being, your emotional being, your, um, your, your, mi your, your, your mind, to let those parts actually, um, those enslaved parts, just die, just die off to free yourselves from that kind of enslavement and to discover your inner promised land and the abundance of who you are within. Yes, of course, you're going to have to fight against those inner giants. In the story, it's f fascinating because the spies come back and say, we looked like grasshopper to ourselves. Surely we must have looked like that to them. This is the voice within us that makes us so small. The voice within each of us that says, I can't do that. I'm not good, uh, smart, tall, um, young, old, enough, whatever is, goes before the word enough. And, and, and those parts of self, they all, oh, they live in fortified cities, will never be able to, to breach those, those, those parts of self that are so anchored in who we are. We are so identified with them. They are giants. But we can never really free ourselves from these voices unless we inquire into them, and unless we and as we see their nakedness, you know, the emperor that has no clothes. But we won't find that out unless we begin the process of self-inquiry, unless we shlach lecha, unless we send to ourselves little inner spies to inquire, what's the landscape of my being? What makes me tick? What is my conditioning that makes me show up in life this way or that way, in positive and negative way? Who am I? Who am I? How do I show up? <laughs>